I come before you here today with my path he coming here being a little bit a little bit unorthodox than a lot of people here on, on the panel, even here in attendance today. My family is originally from Mexico. However, I was born here in the United States, and I grew up in the great town of Wheaton. Uh, uh, however, it's unfortunately located in the terrible state of Illinois. And it's because, and if you know anything about Wheaton, it is a very white, heavy town, and it's because of those demographics growing up, I had a little bit of an identity crisis at an early age. I didn't look a lot like my fellow classmates, and it was made a little bit more complicated by the fact that my name, Julio, is spelled with a J, however, you don't pronounce it like you would pronounce it in English. It reached the point, when I was still very young, that I hated the fact that I was of Latino descent. I wanted nothing to do with it. I even briefly uh, changed my name to uh, Andrew, which is the English version of my middle name. That's how much I wanted to kind of shed that background. And it wasn't until I was in junior high that I actually finally realized that it was actually pretty childish of me to be concerned about what, you know, whether an ignorant person, uh, whether it was willing or not, to, you know, whether or not they thought about my Mexican heritage. Uh, and so I decided to change my name back again, much to my parents' annoyance. Uh, but I still very much embraced my heritage while maintaining the fact that I'm proud to be an American. When I became older, I did want to give back to this great country, and so that's why I enlisted into the Marine Corps Reserves to do a small part in paying back what uh, this country had offered my family because I just know for a fact that if they had stayed in Mexico, uh, my life would have been radically different, and let's be honest, it would have probably been for the worst. Uh, so why tell you about my quarter of a quarter midlife crisis? Well, it's just the simple fact that my liberal counterparts would ha have me believe that growing up in a very heavy white uh, town that in order to succeed and get ahead, I would need things like, uh, you know, equity or, or uh, things of that nature in order to be successful instead of using hard work and using my own uh, basically initiative to try to get to where I am today. Uh, and more, now more than ever, our nation's institutions from education to the mainstream media, which I'll be talking about in a little bit, uh, seem hellbent on dividing us on our race, and they divide us in other ways too, but race is one of the major points. And uh, you know, I, I really think that what we saw in 2020 and how everything played out and what I saw in 2020 uh, was the worst of what that worldview has to offer. Uh, you know, I can stand before you here today and honestly say that in my 26 years of living on this earth, uh, when it comes to in-person interaction, I've only experienced two instances of actual racism. Now, you know, of course, they were, they were small and fleeting, so it doesn't really matter to, to me in the long term. Uh, but, you know, in contrast, every single time someone has been racist to me uh, on the Internet, whether it be calling me a race traitor or saying that, you know, I'm turning my back on my heritage, it's always been from people on the left because they don't like the fact that uh, I can think for myself and reject the victimhood orthodoxy offered by our supposed betters. You know, as I, and as I mentioned before, I, I really did see all that play out uh, of what just what can happen when everything kind of explodes hot onto the streets in, in 2020. I covered riots starting at the very beginning in Minneapolis, uh, going to Chaz uh, in Seattle, which became Chop. Uh, it, it was the whole. It was, it was basically that South Park episode where the hippies take over the town. It was like that, but come to real life now. But unfortunately, because this is real life, uh, uh, this was an autonomous zone to promote the idea that black lives matter, which of course they do, uh, but who ended up getting killed in, in that zone? It was black teenagers. It wasn't even adults, it was teenagers. And to this day, I, I, I'm not even aware that uh, their murderers have been brought to justice, and I don't think, unfortunately, they ever will. You know, and what really happened in 2020, and even a little bit into 2021, had helped expose the rot that is still infecting our once trusted institutions. Uh, perhaps the most egregious example of this from the mainstream media was the reaction to the shooting of Jacob Blake by a Kenosha, Wisconsin police officer. Now, as I detail in my book, there were countless examples of the mainstream media immediately claiming that Blake was an unarmed black man who was needlessly shot by a white police officer. There was no time to figure out whether or not what led up to the shooting, what actually happened. All we had was that 10-second you know, video, and that's all that mattered, because obviously this was just another example of racism in policing. Now, it's partly because of that, this once quiet lakeside town found itself engulfed in one of the most destructive riots in the country's history. This is a town of a population of only around 100,000 people, and yet $50 million of damage was done in a matter of, of days. 
Uh, not only did we since find out that Blake did have a knife on him and he resisted re arrest from police officers, but he was in the process of kidnapping children from the mother who he was accused of sexually assaulting. It was the mother who called police for help because, as I said before, he was getting ready to drive off with her kids in the back seat. And he was in the process of violating a protective order that she had out against him. Now, none in the media who encouraged or justify the Kenosha riots have apologized or faced the direct consequences like those who still live in Kenosha today. I've been to Kenosha many times since the riots, going as far uh, back in, in, uh, in September, and then most recently covering the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, which was yet another thing that came out of that disaster. And the, scar and the physical scars are still very much in that town today, uh, you know, uh, where there was once rubble, there's now empty lots that will never be rebuilt because who wants to invest in a riot-prone town? The most recent example that we have of the media being duped yet again by a supposed hate, race, hate incident perpetrated by racists was the controversy over the BYU volleyball game uh, against Duke. Remember when a black Duke player accused the fan section of hurling racial slurs at her. Now, of course, again, what happened? Immediately, the school banned uh, the supposed perpetrator. The media did not even bother to even try to hedge whether or not this was true. They immediately said that this was a racial incident, no questions asked. Now, since then, uh, the BYU and the, police and the school's police department has done an ex exhaustive investigation, and there is no evidence to support such accusations. And in fact, we later found out from the school newspaper that the school banned uh, a, a fan with, uh, who was mentally challenged. And he was sacrificed basically on the altar in order to appease this mob that was going against BYU. And even, of course, now, uh, still today, there are still some people who believe that this racial hate incident actually happened, which in fact, as far as all the available evidence has, it did not, it, it did not occur. And but of course, even before the investigation concluded, and despite the ample evidence, a USA Today sports editor accused Republicans of, con of a conspiracy theory akin to QAnon and a lot of other baseless <laughs> accusations. Now, another way, and this is kind of the, my own personal kind of crusade against the mainstream media, but the, the way that they inflame racial tensions is by their continued insistence on using Latinx to describe the Latino community. Uh, this is despite the fact that the Hispanic community has repeatedly said, we do not like that term, please don't call us that. That's, you, don't even, you can't even pronounce that word in Spanish, and granted, my Spanish is not entirely great, I'm working on it, but I even know that you can't use that because it's a gendered language and you can't just throw an X on it at the end and think everything's gonna work out. The media knows the polling, they know how the community feels about it, and yet they still use that slur in their headlines and in the bodies of their stories. Now, part of my job has been to highlight hypocrisies of the liberal media and the left in general. Uh, now, I know it's become kind of a meme in order to kind of mock about how, oh, well, you know, imagine if conservatives did X, Y, or Z. And, you know, of course, while we shouldn't uh, rest our entire rhetoric and debate on just simply the left's double standards, uh, from my perspective, I believe it's important to document uh, such inconsistencies for historical purposes. Uh, you know, that's part of the reason why I wrote the book is because most of my, uh, up until then, all my reporting had been uh, on the internet, whether it be through Twitter or through Town Hall. Uh, and I wanted to have a physical medium of their statements that they were making in 2020 because as we have seen, they have the Democrats and the mainstream media has, has realized just kind of how disastrous it is to wage a war on average police officers because now we've seen the massive increase in crime. And so they have since attempted to rewrite history by trying to claim that it was actually Republicans who wanted to defund police officers, which is just absolutely mind boggling. Uh, but the reason why it's important is because there, with this increase in crime that we've seen in cities, a vast majority of it has been minorities, specifically blacks and Latinos. And so the blood of the minorities, who are first and foremost Americans, have been spilled because we have an activist media class who is insulated from the progressive policies that they champion from their various platforms. And I know this because since the riots, I've spent much time on the streets of America where they dare not go. Now, because I'm a normal person, I've spent this most recent Independence Day weekend covering the many shootings that took place in Chicago. In my short time there, one officer was shot in the line of duty, thankfully he survived, but then another officer, the very next day, took her own life, 
and a 10-year-old boy was struck by a bullet in his leg when it was fired into his bedroom. He wasn't out on the streets. He wasn't anywhere he wasn't supposed to be. He was in his room, and he still ended up getting shot. That is a reality that many of our fellow Americans are facing today. And we can, t we can tie a lot of back to what happened in 2020, and we can look at who was providing cover or who was trying to justify what was going on when, of course, what was actually happening was indefensible. Now, even when it comes to the ongoing border crisis, which I also have covered extensively since, since last year, conservatives have been accused, again, by Democrats and people in the media, of being racist because they're fear-mongering about brown people. Now, of course, this is far from the truth. Uh, you know, those in New York City or Washington, D.C. haven't seen the human tragedy of what open borders bring. They haven't seen the five, six, seven-year-old children who were brought over the border without their parents. They haven't seen the women who have, been, who have to carry birth control pills so that when they use it, not if, because they're going to end up getting raped while they're making their way north. And they haven't seen people nearly dying of heat stroke because they have been abandoned by the coyotes and have left them to die. And they also haven't seen police officers break down in tears as they recall finding dead bodies at a much higher rate than they used to before. Now, all this is to bring back to the personal story that I first told you about. Had I been stuck in the victim mentality that is being per perpetuated by the left and amplified by the media, I probably wouldn't be speaking to you here today. I would probably be believing that the white people are the root of my problems, and I need things like the government to act on my behalf in order to uh, be successful, or I just need things at white people's expense, and that is something that I don't believe in. But kids these days are inundated through the media and amplified through social media that skin color is all that matters. It is a dangerous path that we are on, and the 2020 riots prove it. It is one of the worst examples of the ends justifying the means. So where can we go from here? Well, one thing I can say is that you can continue supporting news outlets like Town Hall, uh, because our fight to hold the mainstream media accountable is unending, and overall, our resources and personnel pale in comparison. That's not to say our journalism is any less than theirs, because once again, it was conservative media who was at the forefront and who told the truth about the Black Lives Matter riots. It, was, it is conservative media today who continue to shine a, spot, shine a spotlight on the ongoing crisis at our southern border. That is why it's frustrating and disappointing to see so-called principled conservatives turn their backs on their colleagues after they were more than happy to collect a paycheck from the supposed dark side for many years. And I just wanted to say uh, really quick, uh, you know, as with yesterday being the anniversary of 9-11, we saw a lot of uh, terrible and just downright untruthful uh, or false comparisons of 9-11 to January 6th. And I can say as someone who did cover the January 6th riot that it does not simply compare to the horrors of 9-11. And I just, I just really needed, I really wanted to say that because it's very, very aggravating. Now, I know this speech hasn't been exactly uplifting, uh, but I'm not going to sugarcoat the situation that is on the ground uh, and that's what's happening all across uh, the country. Uh, what I will say, it has been encouraging uh, being here at NACON and seeing like-minded people gather and talk and d debate different ideas and becoming invigorated by that. Uh, because oftentimes, especially as someone who is constantly consuming media, uh, you can get a little apathetic. You can kind of get into the mindset of like, oh, well, this is kind of all kind of hopeless. Uh, but I really think that the ideas being presented here, uh, if it can actually be put into action, it can truly make our country great again. Uh, you know, that's not to say it's going to be easy. It's not to say that there are not going to be some failures along the way. But I believe that we can truly uh, right the ship that we are on. And it's really important because, as I kind of laid out before, American lives, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what skin color they are. Uh, they, they're depending on it. They're depending on the success of the country. And uh, we, you know, we're in a tight spot right now. But, you know, I still very much love this nation, and I want it to succeed, and I know the rest of you do, too. So thank you very much.